all may be seated. It's certainly good to uh, see everybody here today. Or well, as you all know, today marks, uh, tonight I should say, marks a very special time for most, not us, but most, and that is uh, Christmas Eve. On this day, many families will come together, share stories, enjoy uh, dinner, and uh, for many, most importantly, they will give gifts, exchange gifts. Now, you know, if you would deny, and I know Jennifer and I, we talk about this every so often, if you would deny that there is an attraction to Christmas, there really is. If you look at the family dinners again and the, the memories, and the, there really is a, a connection there, but beneath the surface, we find something much more uh, sinister, a day steeped in paganism. So in this message, I want to expose the origins of Christmas and show where this tradition came from and, and why we as uh, believers should not be doing this day, following this day. As we uh, will see, this time has nothing to do with the Messiah. And it really has everything to do with sun worship. And again, we'll see that throughout this message. Now, I want to be, begin by asking, why December 25th? That's really, I'd like to start there. Why December 25th? What connection, if any, do we see between the Messiah and this date? Well, here's what the New Catholic Encyclopedia says. We're going to look at many, many references because I don't, I don't want you to take my word for this. I want to prove and show beyond a shadow of doubt why we uh, don't do these things. Anyway, this is a New Catholic Encyclopedia. It says, inexplicably though it seems, the date of the Messiah's birth is, is not known. It says the Gospels indicate neither the day nor the month. Now, think about what we find here. Historically, who established the date for Christmas? Who was this? Or the Roman Church established the date for Christmas. So we see here that the very source responsible for December 25th as a day for the Messiah's birthday is acknowledging here that the actual date is unknown. So we see here that the traditional date for the Messiah's birth really has no evidence. There's there is no indicator exactly when he was born. Now, there is a season, and we're going to see that as near the end of the message when we get into the scripture and what that says. But there's nothing historically, nothing scripturally pinpointing the day when our Savior was born. This source also confirms here that, that again, the, the, it was just completely unknown. And we, we find something similar to this, and this is a real long title, was the Encyclopedia Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. Say that five times fast. But it really is a great, great reference. There's a lot of truth here. So here's what it, this reference says about Christmas. This is the fathers, and this is the church fathers, by the way, those who were over the church, of the first three centuries do not speak of any special observance of the nativity or the birth, no corresponding festival was presented by the Old Testament. The day and month of the birth of the Messiah are nowhere stayed in the gospel history and cannot be certainly determined. Now, think about the impact of what we find here. It says that the fathers, and again, these are the church fathers, these are those that were over the church. It says during the first three centuries, 300 years, spoke nothing, nothing about uh, the date of the Messiah's birth, the celebration of the nativity, anything that would relate to what we find today. So we see here that a celebration honoring the Messiah's birth was unknown to the very men who governed the church, again, for the first 300 years. You would think that such an important event would have been known, that they would have known about Christmas or some sort of observance and honor of Yahshua's nativity, but that's not what we find here. And again, this is a very, very astute source, a source that I think we can rely in, the fact that they were oblivious really shows, again, that there's no historical ties to Christmas and the Messiah. This comes from a different source. And again, we know that, sor that, that source is a pagan source. It's really connected to sun worship. We're going to see that, again, as we go through this, this uh, message. And really ushers all the way back to the time of Babylon. Now, this message, I want to really focus though, during the time of Rome, because this is when the church adopted uh, this uh, date, December 25th, for the Messiah's birth. So I want to really focus what was occurring during the time of Rome or the Roman Empire at this uh, time of the early church. Now, if you go back historically and you look at the Roman Empire and what they were doing, some of the observances, you're going to find three observances all connected with Christmas or the date of December 25th or something very close to that. 
Now, possibly the greatest and uh, most popular of them all was a day known as Saturnalia. This was an observance to honor the god of Saturn. According to many historians, though, this uh, festival resembled more of a Mardi Gras, New Year's. It was a time of a, a, a decadence, a time to uh, party, a time to engage in different forms of immorality. We'll, we'll read about that as in, in, in a few, uh, few references. So what does scholarship say then about this Saturnalia? Well, here's from the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Americana, volume 24, page 316. It says Saturnalia, a Roman festival commemorating the happy period under Saturn. So there it is. It has nothing to do with the Messiah. This was Saturn. When freedom and equality reigned and violence and oppression were known. It probably originated as a harvest celebration. I find that kind of interesting that, that, that this would really be around the harvest season. Under the Caesars, it was celebrated from the 17th to the 23rd of December during which period public business ceased, masters and slaves changed places and feasting, giving of gifts and general license prevailed. So we see here that Saturnalia was a celebration to honor the god of Saturn, and it was from December 17th through the 23rd. So it was a seven-day observance. Isn't that interesting? I don't know. I don't think there's a tie necessarily to tabernacles, but seven days, harvest festival, same thing here. Commemorate a harvest festival originally in seven days in duration. Of course, that was changed as we see it was extended with the uh, Caesars. Now, do you believe that, there's, uh, that this is simply a coincidence, that, that uh, we have Christmas and we have this day known as Saturnalia, this time, and how it closely corresponds to one another? Where well, I can assure you, this is not the case. This was, this was uh, partially led to the adoption of December 25th for the date for the Messiah's birth. Now, how was this feast observed in Rome? Now, this is really important to understand because, as we're going to see, many of the early Americans and even some of the Puritans in England refused to have anything to do with this day because of the association to immorality. So how was this day observed? It was a time of happiness and equality. You know, we see that today, don't we? Christmas, for the most part, is a time of happiness and equality. Uh, for example, we see here that slaves and masters would trade places during this time. It also says here that they would, they would give gifts and that feasting or banquets were common. Same thing. We see the same thing today. You know, it's amazing how things stay the same even when time passes. And again, we have 2,000 years passing. And yet, so much of what we see within today's Xmas celebration is still seen or was seen and was being done many, many, many years ago. Find a little bit more about Saturnalia from another reference. This is from the Standard Encyclopedia, American Encyclopedia, Volume 11. It says there, Saturnalia, the feast in honor of Saturn, again, says so in honor of the, the deity of God, Saturn, celebrated by the Romans in December and regarded as a time of unrestrained license and merriment for all classes, even for the slaves. Again, they would trade places. Hence, any time of noisy license and rivalry, unrestrained licentious merrymaking. So again, we see that this day was in honor of the god of Saturn. Again, it's important to understand that this day is not, uh, has nothing to do with the Messiah. December 25th has nothing to do with the Messiah. This was in honor of the, the deity of Saturn. Now, notice again how this day was observed. It says here that it was a time of noisy license and rivalry. You know, many historians, again, will describe this time as... Mardi Gras or New Year's or some other decadent time or festival that we've seen either modern or in antiquity. It was a time of parties, of drinking, engaging in excess and immorality. Matter of fact, it uses the word here licentious to describe this time. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines this word in this way. It says, lacking legal or moral restraints. So during this time, there was no moral restraints. You know, things that were morally frowned upon, were okay during this, during these seven days of Saturnalia. They would drink, they would again engage in all kinds of immorality, and, and again it was simply overlooked because that's the culture, that's the way they observed this time. So we see here some of the historical roots for Christmas, and it has nothing to do with anything solemn. It really, again as we find here, is rooted in pagan, uh, immoral, decadent, Worship. 
Now, we also find another leg or another tie to Christmas in a source called Mithraism. Mithraism, this led to uh, Christmas, is pagan worship actually goes all the way back to ancient Babylon, or ancient Persia, I should say. It's one of the oldest forms of uh, worship that's connected to Christmas today. We're going to, again, focus, though, mainly on Rome today, but I want to give you a little bit of history here. This is from the New Standard Encyclopedia. This is on Mithraism, or Mithraism. Uh, it says a uh, Perso-Iranian uh, divinity whose worship is, uh, after passing through several changes and transformations, spread itself for a time and uh, for beyond the limits of its native seat. In the Zend Avestan, I think that's how you pronounce that, or sacred writings of the ancient Persians, Mithras appeared as chief of the Isids, or God uh, Jani, I believe, the lord of all countries. After the Persian conquest of Assyrian Babylonia, Mithras became the sun god and was represented by the orb of day, which was worshipped in his name. This religion was introduced into Rome, 68 BC, by some Cilician pirates whom Pompey had captured. So this is the history of Mithraism and Mithra, as we, we find in other references. We find here that it began in Persia, ancient Persia. And according to the Zend, uh, Zend uh, Vesta, this is the uh, writings again of the ancient uh, Persians, the religion of, uh, the, um, religion of Zoroasterism. This was actually uh, very much still alive even during the time of Muhammad, the Zoroasterism. It was the uh, religion of the Persians. Now, as this religion spread, we see here that something happened to this deity, to this Mithra, that it changed, that it went from more of a sun deity, and that's really how this is depicted within the Roman culture. It was a sun god or a sun deity, and, and that's one reason why it's connected to Christmas. Now, exactly, though, where is a connection here between, between Mithraism and, and uh, the Messiah? or Christmas. Where's the connection? Well, it really doesn't say here, but if you go back in antiquity and look at the Mithraic rites and, and how they would observe this time, one of the days, matter of fact, the most important day within Mithraism was, was his birthday. His birthday, Mithra's birthday. Guess when the birthday was? It was December 25th. But uh, December 25th represented the birthday of, of Mithra. And again, this is partially where we find uh, that the church discovered 25th for the birthday of the Messiah. This had a major, major impact on why the church decided and adopted this day. Mithraism was a major religion during the early church. According to some historians, they say actually for a short time, this is really fascinating if you look at it, Mithraism even rivaled, even threatened Christianity. Not, not, not all Historians agree with that, but some historians will say Mithraism had such a hold in ancient Rome that it even threatened the church. So the church had to do something. So we find historically what the church did is they simply adopted this day, December 25th, the birthday of the Mithra, and for the Messiah's birthday, as we find historically. Now there's a third system that also contributed to uh, Mithra or to, to Christmas. It's called Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus. It's Latin. It means unconquered sun. And as you can imagine, this has everything to do with sun worship. I want to read from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says here, during the later periods of Roman history, so this is late Roman history, sun worship gained in importance and ultimately led to what was been called a solar monotheism. I really find that fascinating, that it had such a hold that it was really all about sun worship at this point. Nearly all the gods of the period were possessed of solar qualities. And both, listen, it says both Christ and Mithra acquired the traits of solar deities. In other words, we're connected to the sun. The Feast of Sol Invictus, open unconquered sun, on December 25th was celebrated with great joy, and eventually this date was taken over by the Christians as Christmas, the date of Christ, or the birthday of Christ. This is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, by the, by the way. No axe to grind. So in addition to Saturnalia and Mithraism, we find here a third observance that contributed to Christmas, and this was called Sol Invictus, again, Latin connected to the sun. And this observance helped solidify December 25th for the date of the Nativity or the Messiah's birthday. This pagan celebration was nothing more than sun worship. It's really everything to do with sun worship. Matter of fact, 
as we find here from Britannica, during this time in Rome, late Roman history, all the you know, uh, deities that, that Rome worshiped, or many anyway, acquired solar qualities, including, it says, Messiah. Now, what does it mean, solar monotheism, where the word solar obviously refers to the sun, monotheism refers to the worship of only one deity. So, you know, at this time, they, they really wrapped everything up into sun worship. You know what's amazing? <laughs> we still see hints of sun worship within the church today. Let me give you two examples. Number one, you know, often this is more with the Roman Catholic or maybe the Greek Orthodox, but you see the uh, halos in the background of the, of the saints. For us, really, sun discs, sun to worship. And then the day they worship on, Sunday, where this comes from the uh, Latin again, dia solus, meaning day of the sun. Matter of fact, according to historians, it was the Emperor Constantine who officially changed Sabbath worship to Sunday. You know, there's this myth out there that the New Testament changed Sabbath to Sunday. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find any mention of Sunday worship. We find the first day of the week, I think it's 12 times, the first day of the week. Sabbath is mentioned 60 times. You know, it doesn't, it's not hard to show historically that it wasn't the Bible that changed worship. It was man. It was Constantine. And you know, one fact about Constantine, many people don't realize this, is he was a sun worshiper. He said, you know, according to most historians, they will say that he converted upon his deathbed. Now, I have doubts about that. I don't know if he really converted or not. Supposedly he did. But, but he, he was a sun worshiper, an avid sun worshiper. And again, this is a man who introduced Sunday within Christianity. I want to read another source. Again, this is talking about the connection with with uh, Christmas and uh, the Son and uh, Messiah. This is from the New International Dictionary of the Christian Church. Again, a very reputable source. These are not sources we, you know, that, that would support our beliefs, by the way. Most are very mainstream. And that's the one thing about Christmas. I was talking to your brother before this message. It's amazing how easy it is to prove these things. All you have to do is open up a dictionary, an encyclopedia. It can be secular, it can be religious, doesn't matter. And they will all say the same thing. They will all show the same evidence. But here's what it says. December 25th was the date of the Roman pagan festival inaugurated and 274 is the birthday of the unconquered sun, Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus. That's what Sol Invictus means, unconquered sun. Which of the winter solstice begins again to show an uh, increase in light. So again, it has everything to do with sun and the, and the return of light. After uh, on, on December 25th, sometime before 336, the church in Rome, unable to stamp out this pagan festival, spiritualized it as the feast of the nativity of the S-U-N of righteousness. So we see here in 274, something very important happened. Rome officially marked this date to commemorate the sun, December 25th. They did this in 274 CE. Now, what's amazing is what occurred about 60 years later. So sometime before this, the church decided to adopt this day for the Messiah's birth. Now, why do you suppose they did this? What was the motivation for them adopting and making December 25th as the birthday of the Messiah? Well, it says here they were unable to defeat this Sol Invictus, this open and conquered Sun, this sun worship. So instead of removing it, instead of fighting against it, we find here that they simply embraced it. They simply incorporated this within their worship, and that is how they supposedly defeated paganism. The problem is they never defeated paganism. They simply brought paganism into the church. And as believers, we need to really understand that. And again, you know, this is not my opinion, by the way. I'm not reading out of booklets that we've produced. I'm reading out of recognized encyclopedias, recognized uh, dictionaries and other sources, both in mainstream Christianity and in, in this uh, secular history, in the case of the uh, Britannica. You know, what's amazing is we still though see so many compromises in the church today. You know, so much of nominal worship is corrupt because of this willingness to accept pagan ideas. You know, it's easy to compromise, by the way. You know, many, we see so many examples of this in, in religion. Matter of fact, you know, we can go way back and we can read about an example. We're not going to read about the example, but I'll just sort of touch on it. The example of Jeroboam. You know, this man, he was rotten to the core. Yahweh, uh, matter of fact, Yahweh called this man originally. And Yahweh says, look, if you obey me, if you do it my way, if you follow me, he says, I'm going to bless you. 
But when push, push came to shove and he realized his own neck was on the line, this man did something awful. He compromised Yahweh's worship. And by the way, he was our first king over the 10 northern tribes or the, tri or, or the nation of Israel, as it became known. And after this, the nation of Israel was never, never the same. It never recovered. You know, it's amazing. You look at Judah's history, you know, the, the, when Israel split. You had Judah and you had Israel. And, you know, Judah would have a good king and maybe a few bad kings and a good king and a few bad kings and a good king. It, it wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't great, but it was decent. For Israel, it was just bad. I mean, every single king after Jeroboam, not a single one had any really redeeming quality. Every single one. And, you know, I blame a lot of that on Jeroboam. Because Jeroboam could have set a great example, but instead he chose to just sort of fudge between the lines and compromise what he knew to be right. And again, I'm not going to go into all that story, but I think there's a lot of parallel here with what we've seen in the church and what Jeroboam did, and, and really the, the result of both. Now we know the result of uh, Israel as they went into a certain captivity. Yeah, we eventually said enough. You know, I've given you opportunities, I've given you time, but um, you know, you're just not going to repent. And so he took them away and uh, allowed the Assyrians to uh, defeat them. Now, again, you know, knowing this, it's important that we understand the roots and, and, and the reason why all this happened. And really, it was nothing more than than selfish. Uh, ambition, selfish results. Now, believe it or not, there were those within Christianity who have opposed Christmas and other days like this. I want to read a little bit about some of these folks. Uh, the first one here, this is from a book called Celebrations. It's page uh, 312. It says, in England, for example, the Puritans could not tolerate this celebrating for which there was no biblical sanction. Notice this. This is from a secular, maybe a Christian book. Certainly not one we, one we wrote. But it says they, were, they rejected it because there was no biblical sanction. It says, consequently, the Roundhead Parliament of 1643 outlawed the Feast of Christmas, Easter, with, uh, Suntide, along with the, with the uh, Saints' Day. So we see the, some of the history there. And we, we find here that the Puritans in 1643... They outlawed both Christmas and Easter. Now, why was this done? Why did the Puritans outlaw these days? Or it says here that these observances were outlawed because they had no biblical sanction. They had no biblical sanction. In other words, there is nothing in the Bible to substantiate that we should be keeping these days. And I'm sure they went back to history and they knew about Saturnalia. They knew about the Mithraism. They, they knew about Sol Invictus. You know, I find this statement here just amazing. The fact that these people had the gumption and the boldness to take such a hard stand. And that's something we're, we're trying to do here at this ministry. We're trying to get back. And, you know, when people call this ministry, they say, you know, you know who are you? What, what, what are you about? And, and I always say, look, I said, really, it's very simple. We're trying to get back to the roots of what they were doing in the New Testament. It's not complicated. You know, they were keeping the Sabbath. They were keeping the feast days. It's not complicated. You know, if you simply read the Bible, it's amazing how many people over the years I've talked to on the phone and, and maybe even in person, and they'll say things like, you know what? I read the Bible and I've come up with the same conclusion on my own because they read the Bible and they did it without any pretense or bias. You know, imagine how today's church would uh, change if it would take such a bold stand. If it would say, you know what? We're going to reevaluate. We're going to look. We're going to see if what we believe fits what we find in Scripture. And they used Scripture as that compass. Or, you know, we would see a change in Christianity like, a, like nothing else. Nothing else. When, it, when we're evaluating our own beliefs, you know, this is something we should be asking ourselves here. You know, is it, does it have biblical sanction? I don't think anybody has all the truth. And it's important as believers, we really try to, you know, evaluate what we believe and ask. Is, is, does this fit what we find within Scripture? You know, the only thing that really matters, and you think that the only thing that really matters is what our Father in Heaven says within His Word. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we worship. The only thing that really matters is, do we find support for this within our Father's Word? If the answer is no then we need to change. Now we find a similar statement 
with another group of people from the uh, history.com, which, by the way, this is a history channel. I try not to refer to too many um, web pages, but the history channel is, is a very reputable source. Here's what it says. It says, in the early 17th century, a wave of religious reform changed the way Christmas was celebrated in Europe. When Oliver Cromwell and his Puritan forces took over England in 1645, they vowed to rid England of decadence and as part of their effort, canceled Christmas. So as part of their effort, they just removed it. By popular demand, Charles II was restored to the throne, and with him came the return of the popular holiday. The uh, pilgrims, English separatists that came to America in 1620, were even more orthodox, they were even more harsh or, or, or uh, hardcore in their Puritan beliefs than uh, Cromwell. As a result, Christmas was not a holiday in early America. From 16, listen to this, so from six, 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was actually outlawed in Boston. Anyone exhibiting the Christmas spirit was fined five shillings. So in addition to the Puritans, we also find that another group refused to observe this day, and that was the, Pur uh, the, the pilgrims. We see here, 1659 through 1681, Boston actually outlawed this uh, day, this time. And I kind of find, find it somewhat ironic that they would fine people if they showed a Christmas spirit. I'm not sure how they enforce that, but, but uh, historically, they, they would have nothing to do with it. They removed it completely as a city. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, talk about the, the uh, separation of church and state. Of course, that's, that's, uh, that's another story all, all on its own. You know, how many people do you think in the church realizes that Christmas was once banned in this country? Was once not observed and, and literally fined in some places for those who showed a, a Christmas spirit? I'd say very few. And you know, those few that do understand it, almost none of them would care. It's amazing to me how many people we come in contact with, normally through Facebook or some sort of uh, uh, social media and they know the truth, and they say, you know what, it doesn't matter. We're not doing it for that reason. We're, we're, we're just doing it for this reason or that reason. They, they just, they don't care what scripture says. They don't care what history says. They're going to follow in their man-made tradition. You know, the hardest thing to break is tradition. That is the hardest thing to break. And, and Christmas, you know, truthfully, I don't think there's a harder tradition, a harder holiday to break. You know, I've seen believers come to the faith, and, and it, you know, I had one example of a, a lady came, came to the faith many years ago. And uh, she told her family for the first time, she says, look, I, I just can't do Christmas. I just can't. And she explained it, and I guess they just raked her over the coals. And after that phone call, she called me just in tears, you know, wondering, you know, how do I, what do I do? How do, we, how, how do I respond? And, you know, sometimes you just have to take a stand as believers. And uh, what I've noticed is your family may never completely uh, come around, and that, that's most of the time. But, but they do learn to respect your position most of the time. And, uh, and if they don't, that's fine too. Because you know what, as believers, the only thing that really counts is, is again, are we worshiping Yahweh as he says to within his word? And if we're not, uh, we're, we, you know, there, there's issues. I want to talk about now uh, some traditions, specific traditions we find. One is uh, the uh, Christmas tree and a good old Saint Nick. So let's talk about these two uh, traditions. Tree worship first. You know, we find examples of tree worship really all throughout Yahweh's word. Now, one example, though, I, I think out of all the examples is by far the best is Jeremiah 10, verse 1. So I want to read that. Jeremiah chapter 10, 1 through 5. It says, Hear you the word which Yahweh speaks unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen. And I, you know, I wish if there was anything to take away from this passage, it's, it's this phrase right here. Learn not the way of the heathen. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's heathenistic, if it's pagan in origin, this applies. Goes on to say, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heavens, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, in other words, are worthless, there's no value to them. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold, they fasten with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs to be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, he says, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. 
Now, does this description sound like anything we're familiar with today? More, I think most of us would probably say a Christmas tree. Let's just take a closer, closer look at some of these, uh, what it says here. It says one cuts a tree out of the forest. We, we see that, right? They, they deck it with silver and gold. It's amazing. They fasten it with nails and hammers. Uh, they, it stands upright. All of these things fit with Christmas tree. Now, this is not their Christmas tree, though. Uh, this is not their Christmas tree. This is actually another form of tree worship. But listen, the Christmas tree arose from tree worship. So it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's a moot point. Because again, Jeremiah chapter 2 says, learn not the way of the heathen. It doesn't matter if it's a Christmas tree or, or some sort of other tree worship. We know that the Christmas tree arose from this false worship. Now, we find many, many references on this. And I want to read one here. This is from the Golden Bough. It talks about tree worship. It says that tree worship is well attested for all the great European families of the Aryan stock among the Celts. So this is in Europe. And uh, oak worship of the Druids is familiar to everyone. Sacred groves were common among the ancient Germans, and tree worship is hardly extinct among their descendants at the present day. And that's an allusion in part to the Christmas tree. So again, you know, tree worship is nothing... Uh, Uncommon, we've seen it throughout the, literally throughout all antiquity. You know, we find it in the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament. I'm not going to describe this. It. Just there's kids in the room. Isn't that sad? There's some things you can't describe because there's kids in the room. And Israel would do these things. It's just it's an abomination. But the Bible talks about groves, and I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you what that is, is exactly. But it involved tree worship, and it's just an abomination. And so we find it in the Old Testament. Of course, we find it all throughout uh, European nations and, uh, and again throughout time. And, and we see it today. It's, it's a Christmas tree. Nothing's changed. I want to talk about another tradition. And now I want to, uh, that is Santa Claus. So what do we find from history with, uh, with, with uh, Santa Claus? Or supposedly the tradition goes back to a man named, uh, a monk named uh, St. Nicholas. Uh, tradition says that he was born sometime around uh, 280 CE near the, and Debbie will love this, near the uh, modern country of Turkey. Tradition also says that he was known for his kindness and piety. It is believed that he gave away most of his wealth because he was so kind, and uh, he did this to help the poor and the sick. Now, the first mention of this man in American culture was at the end of the 18th century. In December 1773, a New York newspaper reported that a group of Dutch families had commemorated the anniversary of this Saint Nicholas. And this is supposedly where the tradition of Santa Claus came from. Again, Saint Nicholas was very kind, was very generous, which are, you know, it's great qualities to have. And, and, uh, but, but really, if you look deeper in history, you're going to find that it has another connection and that going back to Norse mythology. And we find that in a book, this is called Santa Claus, Last of the Wild Men. What a title, right? It says this, it says, children would place their boots filled with sugar, carrots, or straw. Now, you know, it sounds like it's talking about Christmas. It's really not. It says, near the chimney of Odin's flying horse, uh, Slipner, to eat. Odin would then reward these children for their kindness by replacing Slipner's food with gifts of candy. This practice survived in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands after the adoption of Christianity and became associated with St. Nicholas as a result of the process of Christianization and can still be seen in the modern practice of the hanging of stockings at the chimney in some homes. So again, it's, it really doesn't necessarily go back to the St. Nicholas, which, you know, from all accounts, was a good man, this, this monk. Uh, it really goes back to uh, Norse uh, mythology, as we uh, see here. And it's, to me, it's amazing, too, some of the parallels. You, you, you know, you have Santa Claus writing on this, uh, whatever it is. And, and, uh, and it's the same thing here with uh, Norse uh, mythology and with the uh, connection to Odin. Let's now talk about what we actually find in the Bible. So that's, you know, uh, hopefully that's been enough um, information to show 
the tradition and why we don't do this day, but you know, it's always important to go back to the Word and really understand what does it say about these things or not say in, in this case. I'd like to begin by asking, when was our Savior born? Now, we've already talked about it, and we know that, that we don't know an exact date, and that's true. We, we don't know exactly when our Savior was born, but we do know, I believe, a season. We know a season, and, and I think maybe even a, during a feast day, but, but even that is, is questionable. So how do we know? Where, where do we find evidence for when he was possibly born, what season he was born? Well, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 13, really provides a great key with, uh, with this. It says that there was, in the days of Herod the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia. Now, we're going to come back to that, but that's really important to recognize, course of Abia, and I'll explain that. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. These are the parents, by the way, of John the Baptist. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh, blameless. So they were good people adhering to the commandments. And they no child because that Elizabeth was barren. In other, in other words, she could not conceive. And they both were now well stricken in years. So they were old. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before Elohim in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot, uh, his lot was to uh, burn incense when he went in into, uh, into the temple of Yahweh, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without in the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of Yahweh standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. He was afraid, it says, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and again, this is a John the Baptist. Now, where in this passage do we find evidence for the Messiah's birth? Which is not real apparent, but in verse 5, we see here the Zacharias, he says he, was a, he served in the temple and his course was of the course of Abiah. Now, why is this important? It provides a clue to the birth of Yahshua the Messiah. Let me explain how these courses worked. From the Old Testament, we find that there were 24 courses, 24 courses for the priests. The cycle of courses began at Abib, so the beginning of the biblical year. They would serve from Sabbath to Sabbath, and they would serve twice a year, right? 52 weeks out of the year, roughly anyway, and uh, 24 courses to uh, provide for the, the uh, priests. Now, we know from the Old Testament that Abia, the course of Abia, was the, uh, the eighth course, so from this, what do we know? How, how, what, what conclusions can we make? Where Abi befalls normally, and again, this isn't a science. We, we don't know a date, but we do know that Abi normally falls late March or, uh, and, and, uh, through early April. If Zechariah then had the eighth course, his course would have began sometime around June, the beginning of June. And based on this, John the Baptist was then conceived somewhere around June. We can, again, surmise this from this course of Abia, knowing how it worked. Now, before we can determine the Messiah's birth, birth, there's one more piece of the puzzle we really need to look at, consider, and that's found in verse 26. So let's continue reading here, verse 26. It says, in the sixth month, this is the sixth month, by the way, of Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from Elohim into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin exposed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hell thou that art highly favored, Yahweh is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with Elohim. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua. So we see here that six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary receives a visit from an angel saying that she too would conceive. So based on the fact that John the Baptist was six months older than Yahshua, when was Yahshua likely conceived. Again, this is just a matter of math at this point. We know that, again, John the Baptist was 
conceived in early, sometime in early June, could have, you know, we're, we're basing it on an average of when Abi would begin. If, ya, if Yahshua then was conceived six months later, this would place Yahshua's conception sometime near early December. Early December. It places birth then sometime in September. So conceived in September, December, and born sometime in September. I want to show you the sh- a chart from the Restoration Study Bible. This is actually located in uh, Luke 1. It says that Yahshua's birth based on the uh, course of Abba. Again, you know, we need to understand these courses, how they worked, what course he was part of. I've already explained that. So let's look at the uh, outline here, the uh, timeline. Based again on the course of Abia, John's conception was sometime in early June. Yahshua's conception then would be sometime around early uh, uh, December. John would have been born sometime in, in, in late March, about, about Abi time. And uh, Yahshua then would have been born sometime in uh, September. So this is the best we have. We don't have the date. There's no way to know exactly when he was born. We're going to read uh, what we say in the Restoration Study Bible. This is from the chart. It says, The first of the 24 priestly courses began at the commencement of Abib. And again, I've already explained that. Uh, late March through early April. The priest would serve a week from Sabbath to Sabbath and would do so twice a year. Of these courses, Abiyah was of the eighth. This would place Abiyah's course from late May through early June. According uh, for the six mo- Accounting for the six-month difference between John and Yahshua's Conception in the normal 38 um, or uh, 38 week, I should say, uh, gestation period, this would place the Messiah's birth from uh, early to late September. Since no record exists of Yahshua's birth, providing an exact date is not possible. However, it is reasonable to surmise that his birth may have occurred during the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's other indications of that, that it could have been around Tabernacles. And, you know, me personally, I'm not totally convinced of that. I I think for sure it was in the, in, the, in the fall, sometime in probably September, based again on, on the uh, course of Abbey, on what we find in the uh, genealogy of Luke. But we really don't know. But what we do know is this. More than likely, more than likely, he was not born on December 25th. So how do we know that? What, what are some of the other clues we see in Scripture that validates this point? Well, number one, we find that Yahweh revealed his, the, the birth of Yahshua to shepherds. So I want to read about this a little bit. But we need to, uh, number one, I, I, you know, I, I think it's important that Yahshua is compared here to shepherds. It, it seems only fitting in some ways because we know that he's our shepherd. So I've always thought that uh, the parallel is fascinating with that. But, you know, historically, we, we don't find any evidence of a of, uh, sheep in the field. But before I read the source, I want to read the scripture here, Luke 2, 14 through 18. It says, and suddenly there was, there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host presiding Elohim and saying, glory to Elohim in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem. And by the way, for those who may not know, Bethlehem is about six miles, about six miles from the city of Jerusalem. And see this thing which has come to pass, which Yahweh hath made it known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in the, lying in a manger. And by the way, that manger, you know, we were in Israel and we went to a place called a Tel Megiddo. You, you've probably heard of it, Armageddon. And in Armageddon, they have a two horse stables. And they actually have the, you know, the, the uh, containers where they would put the hay. And, um, and, and supposedly, that's probably where they put Yahshua. It really is amazing. I should have got a picture of that. But anyway, it says, When they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Now, I want you to notice a few things here. Number one, where are the, where are the wise men? Yeah, you, you normally hear the, the traditional story, right? We have the, the shepherds and the wise men, and they're all bowing before the manger, the infant Messiah. But we, we don't really see any infant, uh, mention here of wise men. We only uh, see shepherds. The other thing I want you to notice here is the shepherds, where were they? They were in the, they were in the field. They were tending to their flock, as we find 
Now, what's, what, you know, what, what's the issue with this? What's the problem? Why, why does this really matter? What, what does it make a difference where the shepherds were? Or we know that this was, again, Yahshua's nativity. This was when he was born. The angels came to these shepherds during this time. And again, they were in the fields. Here's what we know beyond a shadow of doubt. And it does not matter what source you look at. They all agree. Scholars all agree. They will say, yes, we know it doesn't matter, but they do know, and they will acknowledge this. And for instance, here's a Barnes Notes, a great commentary, very mainstream, though, within Christianity. It says, uh, remaining out of doors. This is, again, referencing to the shepherds out in the fields. Under the open sky with their flocks, this was commonly done. The climate was mild, and to keep their flocks from straying, they spent the night with them. It is also a fact that the Jews sent out their flocks into the mountainous and desert regions during the uh, summer months and took them in in the latter part of October or the first part of November. So basically from like Abib all, you know, through maybe the seventh or eighth uh, Hebrew month. When the cold weather commenced, this is while, uh, while away in these uh, deserts and mountainous regions, it was proper that they should be uh, someone to attend them to keep them from straying and from the ravages of wolves and other wild beasts. It is probable from this that our Savior was born before the 25th of December, or before what we call, quote, Christmas. At that time, it is cold, and especially in the high and mountainous regions about Bethlehem. But the exact time of his birth is unknown. There is no way to ascertain it. By different learned men, it has been fixed at each month in the year. Nor is it of consequence to know the time if it were G.O.D. would have preserved the record of it. Matters a moment are clearly revealed. Those which he regards as of no importance are, counsel, are, are concealed. Isn't that amazing? You know, I've, I've never noticed that the, the, until now. You know, where, where it's not important, he conceals it, it says. Or guess what? He doesn't give the birth of the Messiah. Why is that? Why do you suppose that is? Or that's because he did not want us worshiping his birth. You know, it's amazing. You know, Scripture says to worship his death, to, to, to honor his death. They don't do that. Scripture says nothing about honoring his birth, and that's exactly where all the attention is within nominal worship today, something the Bible says nothing about. So here we find evidence, again, from a very, very reputable source, very reputable source within Christianity, saying that it's impossible that the Messiah would have been born December 25th. Because look, the shepherds aren't out in the fields. It's not a surprise. And it's amazing too. Again, the vast majority of scholars and ministers and theologians, they will all say this. They will all acknowledge. There's a show the History Channel put out, History of Christmas, I think it's called. And I mean, it does a great job. I mean, it goes through and it talks about all the history. And then at the very end, it says, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's one of the best videos showing the history and, and where this day came from, but at the very end, it's for the kids. It doesn't matter. But it does matter. It does matter. And look, we're not saying any of this to condemn anybody or put anybody down. That's not, that's not our purpose. I mean, I know there's people learning, and that's great. We're not saying this to put anybody down. But, you know, as believers, we should all want to worship Yahweh as he says to within his word. And part of that is making sure that our worship is right and pure according to his truth. Now I want to consider another piece of the puzzle, and that is wise men. I sort of referenced these wise men, and it's odd, they're not mentioned there in Luke, right? No, no mention of wise men, they, they're just, they're gone. The traditional story says they were there, but again, no mention. Well, there's a reason for that, it's, it's not in the Bible. So let's look at wise men. This is actually in Matthew. Matthew 2, 1 through 2, and also 10 through 11. It says, Now when Yahshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Notice that, king of the Jews. Notice. For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. So again, nothing so far about his birth. When they saw, and this is verse 10, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they came, were come into the house, not manger, they saw the infant, no, young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And 
When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, this says. So we see um, evidence here of, of wise men. But what else uh, don't we see? Well, number one, it says nothing here about three wise men. It just says wise men. You know, you know, considering the importance of this event, and I mean, there's all kinds of different debates and theories out there, but considering the importance of this event, you know, I could imagine maybe there was a dozen or more wise men that came. You know, some say one, some say two. I don't know what it was. I mean, Scripture doesn't say, but I think, you know, whoever these men were, some say from the ancient country from Parthia, and uh, again, I've heard many, many theories, but they were there to worship the king of the Jews. And uh, I, I tend to believe that there was probably a... a, a many more than just three. But the point is, there's nothing here about three wise men. It's just not found. And it doesn't give a number. Number two, they were not there to uh, visit the uh, infant Messiah in the manger. It says here that they visited the boy Yahshua in, in, in the house. So this is not his birth, and this is why it doesn't mesh the shepherds and the wise men two different times. One did occur when he was born, and that was the shepherds. They were there, and they witnessed that. But now the wise men, they came much later. And we see again that in verse 11, that they, were, they, they did not go to the manger. They went to the house. And when they were not there to, uh, to visit the infant, but the young child. And number three, the wise men were not there to worship his birth. There's nothing here to indicate that they were there for his birth. Matter of fact, what it does say, though, in verse 2, is that they were there because he was a king of the Jews. They were there to pay homage, to honor his position as a king of the Jews. has nothing to do with his birth, everything to do with who he was and who he would become. So we find here that other than wise men visiting the Messiah, almost... You know, nearly the entire traditional story is, is absent, nowhere to be found. Again, there's no mention of the number of wise men. There, there's no mention of a manger. And, and, and they weren't, weren't there to worship his birth, but again, to honor the king of the Jews. Now, how old was Yahshua? Do we have any indication of that? Do we know about approximately what age he was during this visit? Well, I think we see some evidence for this in verse 16. It says in Herod... And understand that Herod, why was Joshua a threat to Herod? He was a threat because he was a king of the Jews. He was a threat because Herod saw him as a threat to his power and his, his throne and his position. So then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, they, they never came back, was exceeding wroth. He was, he, was, he was pretty upset and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and on all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So we find here that Herod killed, he murdered all the boy boys or, or, or uh, mill children, two years and, and under. Why do you suppose he selected this age of two? Well, Yahshua was probably around that age when the wise men came to visit Obviously, that's why he would have chosen. If the wise men were there to visit an infant Messiah, he would have never killed those two years and, and under. So again, from this, we find that even the traditional story of the uh, infant holds, holds no scriptural uh, weight. The story of Christmas is, is not to be found in the Bible. The story of Christmas is found in pagan tradition, again, that the church adopted through compromise. And I'm not going to go through all the examples, but again, remember the big ones. Remember Saturnalia. Remember that. Remember December 17th through the 23rd. Remember that it was in worship of Saturn. Remember that it was a, like Mardi Gras or New Year's, a big bash full of decadence and immorality. Remember that. Remember also the Mithraism. The most important holiday or, or, or observance in the Mithraic religion was Mithra's birthday, December 25th. Remember that. And also remember Sol Invictus, again, the sun deity that led to this date. Nothing to do with the Bible. Everything to do with the church. Church's unwillingness to hold fast to the word and wanting members. And that's really sad because, you know, we see the same thing today. We see the same trend 
in churchianity today, and that is, how can we get more people in the door? How can we compromise? How can we make it more inviting? What, what can we adopt? What can we do? How can we make it more appealing to, to these people that they will come in and they will fill the pews and give tithes and offerings to the church? The same ideology, the same, the same mindset that the church had many years ago is still very much alive in churchianity today. Jeremiah says again in chapter 10, verse 2, he says, learn not the way of the heathen. And again, as I mentioned, it does not matter what the rest of the passage says. It says, learn not the way of the heathen. And you know, the Puritans, the pilgrims, many early Americans. By the way, did you know that the first Congress was in session on December 25th? They had no need to take off for Christmas. Again, it wasn't a big deal in America at that point. Not like it is now. But again, we find that we're not to uh, learn the way of the heathen. heathen. This includes any and all days that would have pagan, uh, pagan worship, pagan influence. Yahweh wants us to worship him as he defines worship. And, you know, again, that's probably where that is the most important thing for us to remember, not only in this message, but really every message. That we're to worship Yahweh as he says to worship him within his word. And if we choose to worship him by adopting pagan beliefs, by compromising, by, uh, by, by, by uh, doing things that he says not to do, we are not honoring him. And that's the thing to really important, important to keep in mind. Now, for those new to this message, I want to, really, I want to really emphasize this point. Number one, we're not condemning you. You know, there, there's people that will watch this online, maybe people watching now. We want them to understand we're not condemning these people. You know, we've all, many of us, we, we had to start somewhere. And uh, it's important that we, uh, they realize that. But you know why we're doing this is to, to help you understand the truth. And it's important as believers that we do that to, to really, not only it's a good review for us, and, and I think every year we need to review this so that, you know, if someone asks, you know, why don't you do it, you can explain why. But it's also important that we do this for those who are new to the faith, for those coming in, because it's amazing how many calls and inquiries we get into the ministry. And people are hungry. They want to know. And there are a lot of people willing to accept this, willing to look into it, willing to to uh, obey, but you know, if no one ever says anything or no one explains what proper and what right is, people won't know. And that's really the purpose, again, of this ministry is to get back to the roots of what they were doing in the New Testament and to really strip away man-made tradition. And, that, and that's what we uh, strive to do every day here at this ministry. And I know uh, we all work very hard to uh, do that. So I pray that this has been a blessing to you. And, and again, we just encourage everybody here to to really search out the scriptures, you know, the, the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And that is an obligation and a responsibility we all have as believers. No matter what it is, no matter if it's a pagan day or, or something Yahweh says to do, we are to comply and follow his word always. Because only those who do this will be found pleasing and in the end worthy. And, and listen, you know, everything we do in this life is really for naught. And, uh, you know, Saul, uh, Psalm says that, you know, we, we, we should, uh, Yahweh teach us to consider our days. And our, our days are, are all pretty short. And this life is short. And uh, we, we have something vastly greater to look forward to in the future. But we're only going to achieve that if we follow Yahweh as he says to within his word. So I pray that this has been a enlightening to you and a blessing. And, and uh, may Yahweh bless you and be with you always. Thank you for watching today's teaching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay up to date with all our latest releases. To stay connected to this ministry, download our mobile app. It's available in the App Store for Apple or Android. Simply search Yahweh's Restoration Ministry. Visit our extensive website at YRM.org. We have hundreds of teachings for men and women alike and new articles added every week. Join our growing online congregation and watch us live every Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Central Time by visiting yrm.org forward slash live or following the live worship link on our mobile app. See below in the description on this video for many of the other ways to connect with us. Blessings and Shalom.